The following interview was recorded with Catherine Marquis for the Purdue University Oral History Project. It took place on June 27, 2011 in the Stewart Center at Purdue University. The interviewer is Stephanie Schmitz. Welcome, Katie. Would you like to start with a little bit of background on where you were born in your early years? Okay, I'd be glad to. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate the opportunity. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio on uh, February 24th, 1931. My parents, my mother was born and raised in Cleveland as a native. My father was born in Swampscott, Massachusetts, worked for Union Carbide and moved around a little bit and came to Cleveland was working in Cleveland and met my mother, and that's where they got married and spent the rest of their life there. Uh, there's four children in our family, two boys and two girls, and I'm the oldest. Grade school, oh, when I was very young, we lived on the west side of Cleveland. And Cleveland, of course, is east and west and south, because if you go north, that's Lake Erie. So, but we moved to the east side, and we lived in University Heights, which is near John Carroll University. The grade school was a Catholic school, uh, very close within about five minute walking distance and we all went there. When we first moved there, the school was under construction so we had, a, the old building had only four classrooms and so there was two grades in each class which was kind of interesting and then the church was attached. Then that fall when we moved there in 1939, uh, the new school was built and we moved into it. But we also had a little plus there because for the first month, since it wasn't finished, we'd go to school on alternate days, which was really nice. So our class, there were the, the nuns, were the, we had uh, Notre Dame nuns, and uh, so that's where I went to grade school. In high school, I went to Beaumont for ninth grade and then went to Cleveland Heights High School for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. The program that I took was college prep, and I was in, it was in the gym, gym and helped out as a aide in the gym thing and also there was a sorority in high school so I was a member of the sorority and there was the English club and things of that sort and along about junior year so I planned to go to college and I applied at a few schools and ended up being accepted at Trinity College in Washington DC and that's where I went. How did you choose Trinity College or the Washington I, DC My area? parents sort of wanted me to go to a Catholic school and I, I was interested in going away. And oh, I forgot to tell you, when I was in grade school, I went, we all went to day camp at different ages. So we went in the summertime was day camp and then one time I went away to, to camp in upstate New York. But we wanted to go to school and I was thinking of going away. So I applied at Manhattanville and also Trinity and a couple of others and decided to go to Trinity. Also. I had gotten to know members of the alumni chapter in Cleveland when I was a junior, and so we had gone to some events and we got to know some of them and then found out there was somebody else going at the same time from Canton. So that's, so I got on the train. I had never seen the school. Uh, I arrived in Washington and took the taxi and he drives up in front and like many institutions there's this brick wall with no sign and I asked him and he said, lady you want a Trinity? There you are. So that's where I was. And I really liked it very, very much. Um, we had a class. The school has grown now. It didn't have any graduate levels when I was there. And it's, a, it's lay sectarian. They, do, they used to have the Sisters of Notre Dame and Moore, but most of the teachers now are lay teachers. They still have a few nuns there. There were more nuns when I was there. But um, it was nice living in Washington. If you're there for four years, you are, can partake or witness one of the inaugurations, which we did when we were there. Um, Georgetown is fairly close, and you got there are a lot of activities. Catholic University is fairly close. My major was I started out in chemistry, then I switched to political science with a split between economics and history, and I got my bachelor's. And there were a hundred. It, it was all girls. The professional schools now have both boys and girls, male and female, but they're all it's an all-girl college, and still is. Oh. Do you live on campus there? Yes, the, uh, we lived on campus, and uh, I had a room. We had first year I was there, I had two roommates, and I got another roommate, and then we had uh, another building I moved to for my junior and senior year. They were like suites. The, uh, there was a bath in between and adjoining, so that was kind of nice. And my roommate was from New Jersey, and so we roomed. To, we had shared a room for a couple of years, and we're still in touch after all these years. She lives in California. Wow. Yeah. And how did you get to socialize with the fellows at an all-girls school? There were a lot of, they planned, there were a lot of social activities. They had, well, they used to have a call of tea dances. 
and they would invite people from the neighboring schools like Georgetown or Catholic University, and then others met people. So there was a, there was a good social activity, and then we had a lot. We had different events, so it it was a it worked out very well. And Georgetown was nice because it was a nice was on the other side of town, and there was also a place where you could lie in the sun near the near the water there. And so we used to go there when the weather was nice. Yeah. The P Street Beach? Yeah, well, no, it was just a wooded area there. It was not a real beach. Oh, it's changed okay. a lot, but when I was there, they had you could row boat or uh, canoes, but also there was a place there that you could, you know, lie out in the sun and things of that sort. So it was kind of nice. And then you veered into library science. Well, after I, after I graduated, I went back to Cleveland, and I worked a couple of years, and then I decided that I would like to go to graduate school. So I applied at Columbia University. I think I was going to go in history because I thought I, when I got my degree, I was now I'm not certified for teaching. So I thought if I get a graduate degree, perhaps I'll do that. But when I got there, I got interested in this program in guidance student personnel administration in higher education. So I switched, and then I needed a full I needed a full time job. So I worked full time for the secretary of the faculty, and then took classes late afternoon and evening. When I was getting close to finishing. I went down to Macy's and I asked them if they were doing any hiring for Christmas. And they said, mm-hmm. How would you like to, to run the cash register two nights and Saturday? I said, sign me up. So I worked there. And then they said, we may have something on a permanent basis after Christmas, which they did. So I ended up being in New York for several years. I had been there. My parents had taken me there when I was younger. So I ended up working for Macy's for three years in their uh, personnel and job review, which was really nice. And I liked it. And that was in New York? In New York, right. Can yeah. you talk about living in New York during that time? Is it was very nice. It was in the 60s. It was quite nice. Uh, I, I had a, a roommate from grad school, and we enjoyed the theater. We, went to, we had season tickets for the opera, which was really cool. But we enjoyed the theater, and, we used to, and then when she left, and I got another roommate, and I lived down in the village, which was really kind of nice. And uh, so I, and I, I really enjoyed all the activities and things there. But then. I went back to Cleveland and I worked in retail personnel for a company and then I decided to go to library school and that's how I went to Case Western Library School and got my degree. And how I happened to come to Purdue was they were doing recruiting and they came and they uh, they came to Case Western and he invited me for an interview so I came and then I was offered a position as a reference librarian so I came July 1, 1968. Wow. Yeah. And when you started at Purdue, how was the male to female ratio in the late 60s? I think there were still more males than females. I forget what the thing is. The enrollment was a lot smaller than it is now, you know. But uh, it was pretty much even, I think, more so than or more than earlier years of, of people that were here before that, you know. And um, when you when you took your first position, what what did that entail? I worked in the general library, which is now the Hissey Library, and I was a reference librarian. And at that time, the library was split on three by subjects on three floors. They had um, the card catalog on the second floor with also the engineering and technology materials. Third floor was social sciences, and the, and the first floor was the language arts, English, the liberal arts, et cetera. And then, so I worked, my office was on the third floor, but I worked on both the third and the second floor. And helped out in reference. And then there was a it was part of the reader services division, which libraries used to have and covered reference and things of pretty much of a general nation. So that was the area that, that I worked in. How was it acclimating to Indiana coming from New York? I well I was sort of I guess because I was raised in the Midwest and spent most of my life so I really in it I really enjoyed it. In fact I, I was thinking the other day, first day I was here first week I was here I thought, well I think I'll go downtown and just take a little drive. I didn't realize that there's one-way streets, and I thought, well, I think I've gone far enough, so I turned around and people started honking like, lady, the go it goes this way, not this way. <laughs> but the uh, some of the staff at that time, they had a nice summer theater, and so I got to go to, the, to those, and also got acclimated to the campus and also the community. And I lived, and I got an apartment. I lived, I lived a little close to campus, and I lived in Beaujardin Apartments for a long period of time, and that was very handy. And then, and also when I got here, there were some people in the library who had season tickets for the football, and so they invited me to buy, get that tickets, and I did, and so that's, what I, that's how I started going, and then went to um, basketball as well. And um, 
early in your career, did you encounter any challenges? I don't think not. I think that uh, with the positions, I think the next one that I had was the personnel librarian. And that um, came about because the person that had handled that before for the library was only involved in the clerical service. But those in 71, 72, whenever it was, they were now moving in the area of search committees for faculty and AP, and it was affirmative action. And so they wanted somebody who had some experience. And also, I had a faculty position. I was an instructor at that time. They had instructor. So that's how I happened. So I got really involved in that. And that, that was very nice. I hired, I uh, was involved in referrals for many of the people and then worked with the faculty search committees because that was kind of a new procedure for both the library and the university. Were you one of the first personnel librarians? No, there, well, probably with that title, I forget what the, my predecessor had because she, she had already retired when I took that over and she may have had that on personnel or something. I'm not real I just don't recall. She has since deceased. But then, move, after, I was only in that for a couple of years when they decided to offer database searching and I was offered the position and so that's what I that's what I've done as the databases librarian for the bulk of the time that I was here. And that that was really challenging. Um, getting the system up and running, deciding what vendors, and I worked very closely with the business office and also with the person I reported to, making suggestions on other vendors that we should get. And we we also trained the people in the school and the department of libraries to do searching as well. And they theirs would be more subject oriented, but I could search across just about any discipline. And we ran, I ran a lot of, uh, we ended up with about 12 vendors, both U.S. And, and in Europe. We had one in England that had the databases loaded on their system. And then we ran a lot of SDIs, selective dissemination, and the people really liked that. Yeah. And I bet that involved acclimating with a lot of new technology. So how are you trained for encountering we, those? When I first started with Medline, the library sent me to the National Library of Medicine for three weeks of intensive training. And it was marvelous because I really learned how they did their indexing. I mean, it was a really, really very good. And it helped going to the other training sessions provided by the vendors because I had a good ground Ground, uh, grounding in a little bit about how their files were put together, particularly the NLM, but it helped me when I worked with Dialog and the others. And also the customer support was always very good. And then when I go to some of these meetings, I'd come back and I'd share that with the search analysts so that they got some of the tidbits and we worked together very closely. It was a fee-based service uh, only to recover. Some of uh, we used some of that money for the training, but it was very not, it wasn't very high, you know. When you were in library school, did you have any inkling that the field would go in that technology heavy <laughs> direction? Uh, not when I was. They didn't really. They didn't really have have that. But in fact, the program I took in library school was more the, for academic libraries. And uh, so, but then we got this. I had a little small computer that I would. In a, you had to hook it into a phone. The phone hookup. And so that's what I would use, and I would take that around. It was portable, and I would take that around to um, some meetings, or also if I went to some libraries where they didn't have the service, and I would uh, talk to faculty about running computer searches, introduce myself. I did a lot of a lot of things going out to the libraries and to the people and tell them about the service, as well as having a brochure that we sent out. And I worked I worked with the people one on one as well. And you did that until 1996. Right. Yeah. It was very, it was very rewarding, and we did, we ran a lot of searches. I mean, we really did, and we had a lot of vendors, and it was well used. And all the other staff in the libraries helped a lot, and they, they really enjoyed it. And they gave talks. I mean, we were invited to give presentations about the database searching and things of that sort, so they knew exactly how to how to do it. But we did it for them. Now they do it themselves. You know. What department seemed most receptive of that database um, searching? We did a lot. Well, initially, since we only had Medline and the medical databases, we served it was some in the life sciences, but it was more in pharmacy and also vet med. Vet med used it quite a bit. Some of them, prior to the library offering the service, were able to either request it through the National Library of Medicine, and they would get back these index cards, and then they would have to look at them. Or sometimes they would also use IU Med, but primarily 
they had to use the National Library of Medicine. So until we offered it here, there wasn't any there wasn't anybody on campus that was providing that service for the for the faculty and staff and students. We had students too. And then you got involved with the Archives and Special Collections. That's right, yes. When Helen Schroyer retired in 1996, she'd been the Special Collections Librarian, and she retired, and Emily Mobley, who was the dean at that time, asked me to be the interim head, and so that's what I did. And I kind of reintroduced, and at that time, I should also mention that uh, part of Special Collections also included the thesis deposit. So the people would come, and they, we had staff that checked that I wasn't involved in that. But then Emily, working with the grad, graduate school, was able to relocate that back down to the, it's all operate out of the grad. But we had people that came in for their checking and depositing of their thesis at that time. Now it's all changed. I think one of the highlights on that was working with the people in conjunction with the program of the Office of the University Events, when Sally Chapman gave that the uh, rest of the Amelia Earhart collection, and we had the program out in Hangar One where she kept her plane, and I worked on all the pictures that we had on display, and then also helped the people in Elliott who put together that video that we have of the program. And then also one of the, we ran some back to campus classes at the same time that I was in special collections. We had one on uh, Lillian Gilbreth, the Gilbreths when they were here, and we had one on Amelia Earhart, too. We had some others, but those particular ones. And then I would set up an exhibit that tied in with what we were doing on Back to Campus. Also, the President's Council used to have exhibits before the brunch, and so the libraries always did one, at least one a year. And hopefully we tried to do one near Back to Campus so it would be tied in with the program, and then some of the same guests could see the exhibit the next day that I would bring some things down there. So that was very nice. What are, some, what are some of your favorite collections in the archives? I think working with the Billerbecks, who did the limited books edition, I think that, and I enjoyed working with the Amelia Earhart. Uh, all of the books were good. The Indiana collection, I, tr I really did a few exhibits on the Indiana collection because a lot of people didn't realize that we had that. We also did one on that children's literature collection that we had up there, the, that woman that had given it. So making them at least not necessarily accessible because some of them weren't on the card catalog, but letting people know about them by having the nice exhibits and it brought some business in there too, you know. And something really important that you've built in the archives is a vertical file, Purdue Clippings. Right. Can you talk about how you that came was to That was already there, it was underway, but it hadn't been really uh, utilized as much and and keeping it very current, and so I use it I've used it a lot because of some of the older uh, materials on individuals, but uh, people used it for athletics, and some people, some of the people from the news service used it when they were writing articles, and they needed some background information because the Purdue uh, news was a little bit different, and they didn't have a lot of archive material at that time, which they now do. You know, so it's used a lot. Athletics, the athletic people used it quite a bit. I know that it was a writer who used to use it for some of the background information in conjunction with athletic department because they have a lot of material there too. <clears throat> and then in 2006 the oral history project right. got underway. That's right. Jim, uh, then uh, Sammy Morris was hired as the head of the archives and it's the first and then ultimately became the university archivist was the head of the archives and the staff expanded but when Jim Mullins came uh, he talked to me and he decided to offer this oral history program and so that's what I've been doing since 06. And it's being able to interview these people to share their experiences of being involved with the university and also um, their research area and things of that sort has really um, been very rewarding to me. Also, we have to be certified, I'm certified in order to do that and uh, IRB has been extremely helpful. When we first got started, we only were doing audio and then video, but now we can do it by telephone and by email, which, which really helps out a lot. Do you know offhand how many interviews you've completed? Mm, it's more than 300. Wow. Yes, more than that, right. And are there any that stand out in particular? That's a very good question, and I get, I get it asked quite often, but I, my response normally is that each one is individually, and they're all very good. and. The people really appreciate the opportunity, so I put I, there isn't any 
they're all interesting. The oldest one I've done, I should say, she was 103. Her husband had been in the placement office for a long time, which was started by Dean Potter, and then he retired in 60, but she was still around. She unfortunately has now deceased, but it was very interesting sharing her memories when her husband was here and going to the basketball games in Lambert Fieldhouse, which was built before Mackey Arena. So, and kind of getting up, one of the things that we were trying to build up in there was people who were here or went to school around World War II or after the war to kind of get a feel for the campus along that time. So we've been able to supplement that. And you worked under a few different heads of the library right. during your time here. That's right. Mr. Moriarty was the was the head when I came, and he, you know, he was involved in the hiring, but he retired shortly after I came. And then there was an interim committee, and then Joe Dagnese came in '72, and he was here until '89 when he passed away. And then Emily Mobley came on, and she since, has since retired. Joe was very involved with with the with the staff, and was very good, very very outgoing. And Emily brought the SOAR system, our online uh, catalog, and a number of other things. So uh, it was very good people, very good. They made many, many worthwhile contributions to the library. And as a faculty member in the Purdue libraries, you were on some committees mm -hmm. and university I was a, committees Yeah, too. the library committee, I was the secretary of the library, of the faculty for a couple of years. We did take turns. And then at one time it was parliamentarian when we first got started. And of course the special events committee I've run for quite a while. The university committee, I've been on several of those. Uh, the staff appeals for parking regulations, I've been on that off and on for several different times and serving as chair, which I was this past year. And then the censure committee, um, the documents and records committee, I've been on as well. And the visual arts committee, I've been on that a couple of times too. And and you are a faculty fellow as well? At faculty fellow, that's correct. At Meredith, I was there for quite a while, and then I was not a fact fellow. Then I was a fact fellow at Tarkington, and, and uh, gave that up. Well, I'm, not, I'm no longer a fact fellow at Tarkington. But it was really very nice. I had a lot of events, and working with the students, it just was very enjoyable, and we used to do different things with them. What do, what do faculty fellows do? Faculty fellow is sort of to interact with the students outside of the classroom, and it was started by Dr. Hovde in the mid, in about 1940s, certainly after he came. And you can have dinner with them, uh, invite them to their home, and then they have a lot of events within the, uh, for instance, one of the things we used to like at Tarkington, they used to have the judging of the floors for the Halloween, and whichever floor won got a pizza, so we would have to judge the floors, and then we'd all get together and decide which one won. And they used to have the, um, decorate the doors for Christmas, too. So there are a lot of activities that you're involved in, plus, getting together with them for meals. And uh, it's changed a little bit now because they have more, when the dining halls are now in the general area and they're not specifically in the residence hall. But it, it works out, it's nice. And many of the people I've interviewed have been fact fellows too for a number of years. And um, can you talk about any awards or honors you've received? I got the, I think it's nice, the John H. Moriarty Award for Excellence in Library Service. And, and because I, he was the one that was here when I was hired, and I also got the Sigma Psi Award from, uh, for helping the faculty with their research, but, which has been really nice. And how about your involvement with professional organizations? Well, I've been a member of ALA. I haven't gone to ALA as much. I used to go, I went to medical, the Medical Library Association for a number of years when I was doing the Medline searches. and. Um, Social Library Association, the Indiana chapter as well as the national, and ACRL I've been involved in too. And how do you keep up as this library, um, as the library field changes and you've seen so many changes, what's the best way to, that you navigated all those changes? Well, you get your online newsletters for one thing. And I think going to the meetings is helpful, particularly if they have any of the local chapters. And I, um, I keep up also by with the publications like uh, American Library Association and, and the other publications. That combination, I think, helps a lot. And, um, and since your time at Purdue, you've had time to cultivate some hobbies and interests? Uh, I have a couple. One of them is that I'm currently collecting music boxes. And I like the older ones, and I get them at the flea market. 
but before that I was collecting afghans and I got those at the fle at uh, Goodwill and they're very well made but I stopped doing that but I I enjoy I enjoy those collecting the music box and they're really kind of nice to have and how about your your social your social life as your career changed and how you what you do for fun as you grow into a librarian? <laughs> well, I take some, I take, I do some traveling, and I enjoy the, I enjoy a lot of the events around the university, such as the athletic events and the convos in the theater. So there are a number of things, and uh, also some of the things in the community as well. I have once in a while I used to go to the Fiddlers, but I haven't been there in a while. That's kind of good. And I know for a fact that you are very into Purdue football, and I'm sure you must have. An, a weekend ritual for celebrating the <laughs> Purdue football games. Well, I have some, yes, I do tailgating at the house. I have a house and uh, I live in West Lafayette, and there's some friends that have been tailgating with me for a long period of time. Some not coming because they're retired, but they come and then they go to the game, so it's been kind of fun. Is it just the, adds to it. The same friends from when uh, you started? Pretty much, yes. A couple of them are, unfortunately have passed away, but we have, we have quite a few that come, and it's, 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 it makes it nice, you know. They, I have some from locally. I have some friends that come from Illinois, Indianapolis, and also the north, uh, the uh, one of the regional campuses as well. So it's kind of a, and the local ones too as well. And they also come for basketball. Not all of them, but some come for basketball. What's your most memorable Purdue football game? <laughs> that would be hard to recollect. I guess. Oh, I think probably. I would, there's been a couple, but I think when we finally found out that we were going to the Rose Bowl, and I happened to be there, and that was really kind of special, you know. Yeah. Even though I didn't go to the Rose Bowl, I watched, watched on TV, but it was kind of nice to be there. Did you ever travel to any of the away? I went to one of the one away game. We played, um, Purdue played USC, and this is when Mark Herman and Bart Burrell were playing, and it had to be in the 80s, I forget it was. They, Purdue Alumni Association had a trip, and I went with a colleague, and so we went out there, and we got there on Friday and the game was on Saturday and we came back on Sunday. It was really kind of fun because a lot of the people, they were from Carmel, the, both the two key players, and so there were a lot of, lot of Purdue people on the plane. It was, it was fun. We enjoyed it. And USC is a nice, that's where they have the Rose Bowl and things, so it was kind of nice to see that. Do you get your family involved in any uh, team rivalries or have you converted <laughs> your family to be Purdue fans? Oh, I should tell you a little about my family. I have the, as I said, there's four children. I have the next one is of my brother. He lives in Cleveland, and he went. He did not go to college. He could have, but he chose not to. So he's married and has several grandchildren, and he has five children. My sister uh, went to Floristone Mather, which is part of Case Western Reserve University, and got her degree. Then she was married, and she had seven children, including twins, and has about 22 grandchildren. They've all been here from time to time. They've come to games and everything. And then I have another brother, my youngest youngest brother, lives outside Philadelphia, and he has three children and one grandson. So that's almost 20 nieces and nephews. Yeah, well, there's a lot. There's a little rivalry I should share, a little personal note. When Purdue plays Notre Dame, when my sister's children were younger, we'd have a little bet that the uh, loser would have to take the winner out to lunch at McDonald's at Christmas. Needless to say that Joan's children had many Christmas McDonald lunches by their aunt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I used to, they'd all fit in a Volkswagen Beetle, so that was kind of a good wow. thing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still curious about how you learned football. I, I can't wrap my head around how the game works. <laughs> I'll, have to give her some, I'll have to give you some tidbits. I've learned by asking people. Ah. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, you have a favorite Purdue tradition? I think the Boilermaker Special is kind of nice. I mean, there's but the Lion Fountain is nice since they restored it, but the Boilermaker Special is kind of nice. And has that been around since you came to Purdue? Oh yeah, oh it goes way back. Oh yeah, right. and it's been refurbished over the years. Right now it is. That's right. Yeah, but it really is. It really is nice. I have to get. I hope to get a ride on it one of these days. Have you ridden on it? No, before? I haven't. Oh my goodness! It's on my list. <laughs> and uh, uh, what about an outstanding event in your life? Um, I think there are a couple things. I think that uh, well, I mentioned about the award that I got to Moriarty since I'd worked for him, but I think working with the exhibit for the Sally Chapman 
uh, Putnam Chapman gift, but also we celebrated our two mil and our two mil plus, and we had a committee that was involved in that, and I coordinated it, and we had that, and that was really very nice. I really enjoyed that. But there were others too, but they, they were really nice. And when you're when you're finished up at Purdue, what are some things that you've got planned? Well, um, prop, I'm going, I'd like to get the 1954 Studebaker up and running again, so that I can drive that around a little bit and probably partake of some of the activities in the in, within the university and athletic events included. Can you talk about this Studebaker in 1954? Uh, it's, it's all original. It does run, but it hasn't run in some time, and it's four-door. It has white walls and a little antenna, in, a little screw inside, and you roll it up, and the antenna works for the radio. It has, we had to put new windshield wipers on when I, because when I first got it, they were real little, and I couldn't really see over that. But we haven't driven, and the, uh, the license plate is Studi 54. <laughs> so I haven't driven it for a while, but I've been promising a couple of people that I'll, get it revved up one of these days. So is, is that a car that you had in 1954 no, um, a friend of mine got oh, okay. it. Yeah, right. So that's how I happened to come. He's a, he is interested in Studebakers and so we have, that's how we came about it. And what's the best place to joyride in Indiana? <laughs> we used to go at the Duck and Diner. We have a well, another we, we have taken it to the Duck and Diner down there on 52 which is now closed and they had several things in there. So we used to take it down there for lunch but we are a little bit careful driving it around town so we don't get rear-ended or something like that. So we'll see. And speaking of local places, one thing I didn't ask you about was how the area changed, um, how the campus has changed in the Chauncey area. You have must have witnessed a lot of... Well, I think that the campus has changed a lot because certainly Discovery Park is one of the big things. That, and the the village is enlarged. It's, a, it's about the same size, but there's different stores that have come in and out. And the mall has has grown a lot. And some of the restaurants that used to be in uh, are, don't exist anymore. So I think it I think it has grown. Certainly the population has grown. The county, people, a lot of people have moved to the county, and that, that's expanded residential-wise. Um, and when you first came to Purdue... Um, where were your favorite places to go? We used to like to go to Sorrento's, and we used to like to go to Sarge Oak, which was downtown, and Sarge Biltz, which was out there on 25. Both of those restaurants oh, okay. are closed. And um, now that the uh, where, Tart, where Kmart used to be, they're expanding that again, which was, Kmart was nice, was very handy, you know, the one that's over there around 52. And what about Harry's? You ever hang out there? Uh, well, I've been there a couple times, right. <laughs> the village is, is very handy, you know, and a couple of these places used to be, that there used to be our drugstore, and they had a little postal department in there, but that doesn't, that doesn't exist anymore. But I think, it, I think the university it has grown. It's very nice. The clock tower, I think, makes it it's kind of fun. People like to look at that. And where's your favorite place to eat lunch on campus these days? <laughs> That'd be hard to do. <laughs> well, we like we like the triple X. That's kind of fun, and Pappy's is nice. It's quite, there's a good there's a good choice, I think. Is there anything in the interview that I left out that you want to talk about? Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this interview, and I've enjoyed being affiliated with the university, and and uh, certainly keep in touch. And it's been very you know, very nice. I've enjoyed all the divisions. I've had a lot of offices since I've been here, so it's been really nice, and uh, I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>